welcome once again to the Upper Room, and by now I am pretty positive you know the series in which we find ourselves. It's called The Expression, and The Expression is truly about knowing that Jesus tells us, communicates to us who the Father is. So we know the Father through the Son, and again, knowing the Father and the Son is eternal life. Eternal life does not come. As a result, I'll get to what you're hearing maybe, <laughs> eternal life does not come as a result of being good, doing enough good things, attending church often enough. None of that. It's just in simply knowing the Father and the Son. So the question is, is, is this an idea that Jesus is the physical representation, the communication to us of who the Father is? Is that just some wild idea that came years later. Well, we already talked to you about John chapter 1 and how Jesus is described by John as the Word. But in John 5, Jesus says this, verse 39, he says, you search the scriptures because you think that they give you eternal life. In other words, that's not a bad idea to look into the Holy Scriptures and see what is eternal life about. But then he says, I got a shortcut for you here. He goes on to say, the scriptures point to me. When you search the scriptures, know that all of them, the old for sure, as well as the not yet written New Testament scriptures, all point to Jesus. And so this series is so essential that we know Jesus and we know him as the communication to us about who the Father is. Scott McKnight writes a book by the title of the King Jesus Gospel and he puts it this way, we have to become a people of the story. I love that. We'll come back to that in a second. We need to immerse ourselves even more into the story of Jesus. Have you ever thought of yourself as being a, a person of the story? That's really our story, right? We are people of the story. What is the story? It is the story of all time. And it's the story of Jesus and how we know the Father through him. And so that's what this series is really about. Now, let's get into what we're going to talk about today. I want to get into it in a little different way. One of my favorite movies, I won't go into the title of it, you don't need to watch it, but in a scene in this movie, there's a guy who's a general manager over a fairly large organization, and he brings on an assistant uh, who is, uh, has nothing really in common with him, and he says, you know what, you need to learn how to fire people. And his assistant is a young guy, and he goes, no, I don't think so. I don't want to do that. He says, no, you need to do that. You need to learn how to fire people. He says, why would I do that? He says, because I need you to do that. And he says, I don't know how to do that. And he says, I'll tell you what, give me your rendition of how you would fire someone if you had to fire them. So the young guy starts in on this long dissertation about, I'm sorry, we've come to this conclusion, and I hope that da 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 <laughs> And the manager, the general manager says, hold it right there. He says, these people are professionals. They just want us to shoot straight with them. And then he gives them this analogy. He says, would you rather be shot in the head or be shot four times in the chest and bleed to death? <laughs> Which the, the young assistant manager looks at him and says, are there any other options? <laughs> I love that line. Is there, could there be a third option? I tell you that story because we're going to talk about something that historically, it, it really comes down to two options. All of history really does, and our perception of history comes down to two options. No third, no fourth, no 100 options when we look at the history of the world. The first option sees history as this unexplained succession of seemingly random events, okay? Uh, nobody can explain it. It's all random. It's meaningless and has no real purpose to it as far as most people see history. And as you imagine, we get into that frame of reference for history based on evolution, right? It's all random chance. There's no intellectual mind behind it. And that's how actually most people view history. That's one option. The second option is to take God's word. And in God's word, what we find out is God himself is the creator and he is the mind behind all of history. 
and he does everything purposely and for a reason and with him at work even though we may not understand the reason life is not lived by chance but is lived with incredible purpose and meaning okay so those are the two options we have and so we obviously are going to take the option of saying I, we believe that god orchestrates everything let me give you one more example of that if you turn in your bibles to daniel chapter 4 or hearing the gunshots go off and notice i'm not ducking because i'm so brave I'm so brave those bullets are going right over my head and it doesn't even make me flinch <laughs> daniel chapter 4 nebuchadnezzar is the ruler of the known world in babylon and he is not just all powerful in the world scene but he is really full of himself and he has said everything that exists is because of me and for me and then even in a dream god speaks to him and says no there's someone else bigger than you but he ignores that dream daniel chapter 4 verse 31 while these words were still in nebuchadnezzar's mouth a voice called down from heaven O king nebuchadnezzar this message is for you you are no longer the ruler of this kingdom you will be driven from human society. You will live in the fields with wild animals. You will eat grass like a cow. Seven periods of time will pass while you would live this way. That is seven years will go by. You'll spend seven years out in the field like an animal just eating the grass. You will have to learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. And it goes on to say that very hour it happened. He turned into this just animal that for seven years is out in the grass eating like all the other animals. Finally, in Daniel chapter 4, we pick up the story again, verse 34. After this time had passed, so seven years had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked to heaven. My sanity returned, and I praised and worshipped the Most High and honored the one who lives forever. I love that. That's a picture of sanity. In other words, the other approach, the other perspective where I'm in charge and everything's about me is insane. Really, it, it's not sane to believe that is what Nebuchadnezzar says. My sanity has returned and look what he does. I praised and worshiped the Most High and honored the one who lives forever. His rule is everlasting and his kingdom is eternal. All the people of the earth are nothing compared to him he does as he pleases i told you there are two perspectives there's two options when we come to the history of the world and how the world operates and nebuchadnezzar learned the hard way but he did learn lesson was learned the question is have we learned that lesson that everything is orchestrated everything is on purpose there is great design to everything in life every little detail and the great things as well nebuchadnezzar learned it have we learned it we know we live in a culture where most people have not and that's a constant source of tension for us isn't it now i want to talk about our location and we are so fortunate to be at a place what it's called san juan shooting range uh, it's a gun range and it's been here for over 30 years and it is owned and run by a, a wonderful man i'll show you a picture of him named paul miller i'll tell you more about uh, my interaction with him and where it started some 20 years ago san juan gun range is a very special place just outside of montrose and we're here obviously for a purpose as usual and you'll see behind me a target today's text john chapter 7 to me, as I read it again, is about a target. It's about several targets. There'll be five targets, actually. There are actually 16 different staging places on this property where you can shoot at targets, do target practice, whether you're a hunter. I know they have another property across the street where law enforcement uh, comes in and uses it as a shooting range. But this today is about targets. As I said, there'll be five targets. The first one is a target of Jesus. And the last one is a target of Jesus. And we'll spend the bulk of our time on that last target. But I want you to see the other four that precede Jesus' target. In the middle will be three targets where Jesus is the bullseye. He is the target of others. 
Okay, so target number one, John chapter 7, verse 1 reads this way. After this, what is this? Well, if you haven't been with us, Jesus has fed up to 20,000 people in Capernaum. So he's up in that Galilee area. And remember, he followed that up with a very offensive sermon from the synagogue in Capernaum. So it was after that, now we pick up the story. It goes on to say, Jesus traveled around Galilee. Okay, what you need to know is that six months have passed. Six months from the time Jesus preached that offensive sermon until this moment has passed. And you may be saying, why the gap? I mean, six months, his ministry was just over three years. Six months is taking a chunk out of his ministry. Well, you need to know that John's purpose is not to give us a day by day, hour by hour, blow by blow uh, understanding of Jesus' life. It is to paint a picture of the Son of God, of how he is deity. So in that picture, he leaves out these six months. Now, okay, if you want to know what happened during those six months, you can go to Matthew chapter 16, 17, and 18, and you'll find out what was going on for those six months. Let me summarize it for you in case you don't go to those chapters. Basically, after being a couple days with masses of humanity, up to 20,000 people, now he zeroes in and focuses on his own 12 disciples for six months. He trains them. And so the first target is a target for Jesus. And it's the target of training his disciples. He no longer concerns himself. And you know by what we said about his sermon, it seems purposely that he wanted to be rid of the masses, the crowds. He now focuses in on the 12 and trains them. This is really important for us because we live in a day and age where this idea of making disciples, the training process of pouring yourself into just a few lives has gone by the wayside, even though Jesus himself commanded us to do that very thing right before he ascended. And yet here we are 2000 years later and we are not very interested. In fact, I've quoted Dallas Willard on this before. He calls non-discipleship the fact that we don't disciple people, the elephant in the living room of the church. It is the thing we all pretend is not there and we ignore it, but it is there and it is big and it is prominent that what Jesus did for six months here, we don't think we should have to do. But I'm here to tell you that the training process, first in your own life and then the life of those around you, beginning with your kids. If you are parents with younger kids on up through the teen years, training them to godliness, discipling them, is the priority of your life. It must be if you're a follower of Jesus. John MacArthur puts it this way succinctly, simply, and profoundly. He says, the Lord did not commission the church to attract large crowds, but to go and make disciples. We were never commissioned. We were never commanded to attract large crowds. And yet 2000 years later, that's pretty much all we do. Of course, Paul got the idea from Jesus. He pulled it off perfectly. One example of how he discipled individuals is Timothy, his son in the faith. He was not a blood relative of Timothy. And the story of how they came to know each other is fascinating. But he became a son in the faith. He discipled him and he writes to him in 2 Timothy 2.2, you then, Timothy, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. This teaching, this training is not going to come with masses. It's going to come with a few. And then when you give them what you have, and that is Jesus, then they will turn and give a few what they have. 1 Timothy 4, 7, the previous letter, he writes this, do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Okay, Be in the training process all the time. And that's another good reason why we're here at the shooting range. People come here to train, albeit for something not near as important as what we're talking about, but it is a training center. And he says, train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good. Now, if you're a hunter, it would behoove you to come to a place like this and sight in and to become proficient as a hunter so that you could provide 
meat for your family and uh, for some of you that I know in our groups so you could put the head up on the wall, <laughs> the antlers up on the wall. But it's all about training. And he says, train yourself to godliness because it benefits your whole life and the life to come is what Paul says. So this idea of pouring yourself into this process of training in your own life and the life of a few others is really what Jesus does. That's his first target. And we just saw it in the first part of verse one, a discussion question. And I really would, there's a lot of discussion questions I'd like to hear you talk about. I'd really like to hear this one. I'll get to hear it with our group. Here it is. How would you suggest that the modern church get back to living in obedience to Jesus' command that we disciple others and put aside our craving for crowds? How would you suggest the church get back to that? So target number one is Jesus' target of his just 12 men that he pours himself into. Target number two, Jesus becomes the target. We pick it up in verse one, the second part, where it says he wanted to stay out of Judea where the Jewish leaders were plotting his death. So he now becomes the target of death threats, of a conspiracy and again, conspiracy theories are, you know, get a bad name because you think all oh, those are people, you know, talking about crazy things. Actually, as you know by now, conspiracy theories become true in a few months. <laughs> and in this case, they are conspiring together to assassinate, to murder Jesus. He becomes the target of their terrorism. They are really out to terrorize him to put him to death. And it is for that reason that he stays up in the Galilee area instead of coming back down into Judea, into Jerusalem, where they are ready and poised to grab him and put him to death. And again, you may say, well, isn't that just John kind of using hyperbole? Uh, why would they want to put the Son of God to death? A man who lived a perfect life. I'll take you back to John chapter 5. We were just there several weeks ago. Verse 16. So the Jewish leaders began harassing Jesus for breaking the Sabbath rules. Remember, he had healed a man, a lame man on the Sabbath by the pool, and now they start harassing him. Okay, It starts with harassing, then it moves on. But Jesus replied, my father is always working, so am I. It doesn't matter that it's the Sabbath, my father is always at work. Again, there's that purpose, historically, that the father has it. He's always at work. So the Jewish leaders tried all the harder to find a way to kill him because he had broken the law of the Sabbath, supposedly. And so it started way back in John 5, and here John says, yeah, they're still at, they're plotting to kill him. He is the target. He is the target of their plot to destroy him. John Calvin commented on this idea that Jesus, for now, stays in Galilee and doesn't come down to Judea, where the Jewish leaders are living and ready to pounce on him. And Calvin put it this way, although Christ avoided dangers, he did not turn aside a hair's breadth from the course of his duty. Just because he stayed up in Galilee for a time does not mean he was afraid. It just means that his duties did not call him there. And that's kind of where we're going in this text. So that's verse 1. Verse 1 has two targets. Jesus targets the discipling of his 12, and now he becomes the target of the Jewish leaders. Target number three is simply a tradition of the Jewish people. They focused in on three different festivals and every man, every male who was Jewish was expected to be in attendance at these three festivals during the year. Which right. traditional uh, targeted festival is this? And so verse two simply says, but soon it was time for the Jewish festival of shelters. Now what is that? Well, it took place in like the September, October, they didn't call it September, October, but on our calendar, the September, October season of the year. So the early fall is when this takes place for the Jewish people. Uh, it is now just six months, pretty much, maybe eight months from the time he will go to the Passover in the spring and be crucified. So we are now suddenly in the last, with skipping those six months, we're in the last year of his life. And this is the festival of shelters. What is it? Well, the historian Josephus said this was the most popular 
of all the festivals for the Jewish people. They would gather for seven days in Jerusalem, and they would build makeshift shelters. And people who lived there did it on the roofs of their houses. Other people came and gathered up sticks and twigs and whatever and built shelters. And it reminded them of their forefathers, their ancestors' time in the wilderness, and how God always provided for them. Okay, so that's what it was. On the eighth day, there was a big blowout, exciting party that took place. But for seven days, this festival took place. That's the festival that's at hand, and you need to know that when we get to the next target. But the Jewish people targeted that festival in the fall. And for Jesus, this would be his last fall on earth. And so we come to target number four. You know the context now. He's in Galilee. And it's time to go to the festival shelters down in Jerusalem in the fall. And we come to what I'm going to call Jesus Brothers targeting him by taunting. And so for the fourth target, I want to set it up with a discussion question. And here's that question. Growing up, what role did taunting and teasing play in your life with your siblings, assuming you had siblings? Or maybe you can think of other families where taunting and teasing played a major role. And if you experienced that on either end of it, how did that impact your life? I have talked to you about the fact that I grew up here in Montrose for the most part. And I think I mentioned that in junior high. But while we were in shop class, Tony Barrientos took out a knife and put it to my throat and threatened me. I've never forgotten it. Fortunately, you know, all he ended up doing was slap me across the face. And I've been in counseling ever since. Just kidding. I haven't. Back then, it's like, well, eh, that's just another day, right? I mean, growing up, being taunted and teased and terrorized. When I was in high school, I told you about Roy DePoe. You know, he was only about this hall, but, you know, he'd been shaving since he was four. And he wanted to fight me, you know? So I had that, but those were adversaries outside my family. I honestly, other than maybe I was on the taunting, teasing side with my younger sister, but other than that, I don't remember a lot of sibling rivalry because I had two sisters, no brothers. Maybe that's why I didn't have that because in our family, our oldest son is 13 years older than our youngest son. Ty is 13 years older than Dylan. And there were just things growing up that happened I, I want to say we didn't know they were happening. Like Ty would put him up on top of the refrigerator and walk away. It developed a fear of heights for Dylan for years. Outside they'd be playing wiffle ball or whatever and Ty would say, you know, that hawk up there, they love little blonde haired boys. They pick them up and carry them away. He was afraid of hawks for years. <laughs> a little closer to home actually, Christy, who's behind the camera, really, she and her sister, terrorized their younger brother by packing him up and saying, yeah, run away from home. This happens in families. Did it happen in Jesus' family is the question. We can get into his family. I don't know what you know about his family, his earthly family. And you know that biblically, throughout the history of the world, there's been sibling rivalries from the beginning, right? Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, Joseph. <laughs> wow, his brothers sell him but tell his dad he was torn to pieces by an animal. I don't, does it get any rougher than that? Did Jesus ever experience that? That brings us to target number four, John chapter seven, verse three. And Jesus' brothers said to him, okay, he's the oldest, but he has four brothers. So we'll get to that. They said to him, leave here and go to Judea where your followers can see your miracles. You can't become famous if you hide like this. If you can do such wonderful things, show yourself to the world. And then John adds this in verse 5, For even his brothers didn't believe in him. His own family didn't believe that he was who he claimed to be. I don't know how else to read that passage or to understand it other than they're taunting him. They're saying, hey, festival's coming up. You better beat feet down to Jerusalem and show off and see how many followers you can get, Jesus. They did not believe in him. They had no confidence that he was who he claimed to be in spite of the fact that he had lived a perfect life. Now, maybe that was part of the problem. Anytime siblings are under the impression that, oh, you think my brother's perfect? Huh? No, well, he probably is. But that makes me mad. I don't know. But we see this kind of consistently. So who are these brothers? Matthew chapter 13 tells us, verse 55, 
Then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter's son. And we know Mary, his mother, and his brothers. So these are people who say, he can't be the son of God. He grew up here. We know his family. They say all his sisters live right here among us. And his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. Judas later will be known as Jude. So he has four brothers. We know he has at least two sisters. And so there's at least seven kids in this family and they live right there amongst the people and say this is a normal family they fought as kids i guess you know so how does this play out i take you down to mark chapter 3 verse 21 when his family heard what was happening they tried to take him away that phrase in the greek literally means they tried to grab him and pull him it was used of police officers who would arrest people they physically tried to grab him and pull him away because they said he's out of his mind. That phrase, he's out of his mind, means his mental equilibrium is gone. All right? He's a crazy man for doing and saying the things he's doing and saying. That is so hard for us to believe 2,000 years later, but his own family said he's crazy. And they tried to physically grab him. That was verse 21. Jump down to verse 31. Then Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him. They stood outside and sent word for him to come out and talk with them. There was a crowd sitting around Jesus and someone said, Your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. Jesus replied, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And he looked at those around them and said, Look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does the will of my father is my brother and my mother. Now he has redefined family. He is instituting a new family. Not because he doesn't love that family, but there is a higher priority now. Doing the will of my father now makes you family. Not just attending a church, but doing the will of my father makes you family. Okay, so we have this tension brewing, and, and that's why we see here that his brothers seem to be taunting him. Acts chapter 1 verse 12 talks about the aftermath of the ascension of Jesus. And so the followers of Jesus don't know what to do. So we know, again, that his family, his brothers especially, were not believers. But watch what happens when the, the followers of Jesus gather in Jerusalem like he commanded them. I pick it up in verse 14. They all met together in Jerusalem and were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women. They've already talked about Peter and the disciples being there. And guess what the last line says in verse 14 of chapter 1 of Acts? And the brothers of Jesus. He's risen from the dead. That's all they needed to see. They are now followers. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul is talking about the gospel and how so many people witnessed Jesus after he rose from the dead. I read to you the last verse of that section of scripture, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 7. There he was seen by James, his brother, and other apostles. Yes, he rose and he appeared specifically to James. Remember, James is the oldest. That's how they did that chronologically, you know, James and the rest of his brothers. And he appears to James. We now know that James not only becomes the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, but he and the other brother, the youngest brother, Judas, who was called Jude, wrote letters that we have in the New Testament. Amazing, isn't it? History tells us that James died a martyr's death. I just wanted you to see the full picture of how it all it came all the way around from his brothers taunting him, trying to terrorize him, doubting him to we would die for him. Now, finally, we come to target number five. Okay, target number one was Jesus' target of the training. He targeted his disciples to train them. Then he becomes the target, right, of uh, the Jewish leaders and his own siblings, his brothers. Now we finish it up with really the point of this text. He now targets his father's timing. Chapter 7, verse 6. And here we go. Jesus responds, replies to his brothers, Now is not the right time for me to go. You know, he doesn't get mad at them. He doesn't say, how dare you make fun? I am the son of God. You know what I could do to you? He just simply says, now is not the right time. He's not reacting to foolishness. He's saying there is an agenda and it's actually not even mine. He goes on. He says, you can go any time. 
The assertion is, you and I are on different schedules. We have a different point to our life at this point. Verse 7, the world can't hate you, but it does hate me because I accuse it of doing evil. In 1 John, when John writes his epistles, 1 John 3, 8, he says that the reason Jesus came was to destroy the works of the devil. Here's what I want you to see about that. Jesus says, I accuse them of evil. I accuse the world of evil. I am telling them what they are doing is evil. 2,000 years later, the church is being taught not to accuse the world of evil, but to accept the evil of the, of the world. And in the name of love, say any way you want to live and any way you want to lead other people is fine. Notice that Jesus didn't use that approach. Jesus himself said, I accuse the world of evil, therefore they hate me. Therefore, this is not the right time. Verse 8, he says, you go on. I'm not going to the festival. And then that word in there, not going, literally has an inference that means at this time. Okay, and we'll learn in the next lesson that he eventually will go. But he's not going to go now. He's not going to go with them. He's not going with, going with the throngs. He doesn't want attention. And so at this time, I'm not going down to the festival. But you all go ahead. Again, I'm not going to the festival because my time has not yet come. Verse 9, after saying these things, Jesus remained there in Galilee. What is his focus? The timing of the Father. That's all that matters to him. Not retaliating with his brothers. Not being coming defensive and saying, how dare you say these things about me? I'm about my Father's business. Have you ever heard that before? From the age of 12. And now it's about my father's timing. You might remember that in the beginning of his ministry, the first miracle he did was in Cana, and his mom comes to him and says, do this. And he says, my time has not yet come. This is not the first time he has said, my time has not yet come. Timing is a huge deal in God's word. There are hundreds of references. We'll just touch on a few. Timing. The history of timing is so important. People like Bruce Willis and Tom Cruise and Harrison Ford are all, you know, known for their action movies. And what's amazing about every one of those movies is there's just that sense that we all have. If you watch them, not that I'm recommending them, but if you watch them, the hero will come through at the right time. My question for you is this, and this is a serious question because I posed it to myself earlier this week. Have I come to the place where I have more faith in the action heroes to come through at the right time? than for God to come through at the right time. First Chronicles 12 talks about all the people, all the different groups of people that David put into his army and had as a part of his army. And I mentioned this before, but the men of Issachar were separated out because they understood the times, meaning they understood what needed to happen at the right time, the right place. He needed those people desperately. We still need those people today. Do you and I know what God's timing is? We may not always know what it is, but we, do we trust his timing? I take you to John 12, verse 20. Some Greeks who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration paid a visit to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. They said, sir, we want to meet Jesus. Philip told Andrew about it, and they went together to ask Jesus, will you meet these people? At this point, you would think Jesus would be thinking, man, I'm towards the end. I need as many people on my side as I can get. That's what I'd be thinking. So how does Jesus respond to, hey, we got a bunch of people who want to meet you, okay? This may seem rude to you, but now we get a clear picture regarding his father's timing and what's on his mind. He's in Jerusalem, right? Near the Passover time. Jesus replies, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone, but its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing about their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me, because my servants must be where I am, and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Verse 27, now my soul is deeply troubled. And now he says this, should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. And he ends this conversation, which is not much of a conversation with, Father, bring glory to your name. He goes right into praying, Father, bring glory to your name. Why? The time is right. The time has come. 
He is so focused that even when they say, hey, we got a bunch of people that want to meet you, I've got to tell you what's going on here. You need to understand the time has come. I will die, and I have to die, and that's why I'm here. And I'm here not for my father to take me out of this desperate situation. Yes, I'm troubled, but for him to be glorified. Look at the connection. Jesus connects God's timing, his father's timing, with glorifying him. Stepping into the timing of the Father, trusting it, that brings honor and glory to the Father. Now that the word time, and it's my time has come, and all those references to it, in the New Testament is the Greek word kairos, and it's really an interesting word because it's not just like, uh, well, a time like a season. It is a period of time that is associated with something being accomplished. So my time has not come, or my time is not yet here, my time has come, is always a period. We are now in that period that is tied to something that needs to be done to honor the Father. Something needs to be accomplished in this moment. You might remember, we've talked about Abraham. Abraham struggled with God's timing, didn't he? I mean, constantly. He obeyed God, but then when God didn't come through at the right time with the right way and the right thing, he would do his own thing. So would his wife, Sarah. They struggled with it immensely, as do we, until we see him not struggle with it when he offers up his son, his only son, because God told him to. He could have easily said, God, this is not the right time to offer up my son. I tell you, I'm not going to do it. You know, he's so old by now, I can't even pin him down on the altar. He did not say that. I was reading this week about GPS. That plays a huge role in our lives, right? Global positioning system. And it really does dictate, I mean, the route of ships and airplanes, and even our cars, our lives, right? What is it about? What's interesting? I found it interesting anyway. The GPS is tied to Albert Einstein's theory of relativity. That is, there is a relationship between matter. There's a relationship between Earth and the satellites in space, and that has to be accounted for. And so they have been programmed. I, this won't probably surprise you, but there has to be such programming so that that is accounted for because time lapses from the time something, a message comes from a satellite in space to Earth, that has to be accounted for. Timing is everything. And how we come up with the timing of things in our life is now essential. I was reading this week John Bloom, who has a ministry called DesiringGod.org, and he was explaining this, the implications of what I just told you about GPS. And here's what he says. How we experience time depends on our frame of reference. And our particular frame of reference is not always the one we should trust. In fact, sometimes it's critically important that we trust another framing more than our own. Learning to trust God's timing is not easy, to say the least. This is partly due to our sin and unbelief. But it's also because trusting a frame of reference different from ours is, by definition, counterintuitive. Since we can't calculate God's time, His timing often doesn't make sense to us. Isn't that a great description of that? We need another frame of reference. If I'm just going to live off my own frame of reference, God's timing will never make sense. So as you can tell by what Jesus says here, his reference point is the Father. That's his frame of reference. It would really behoove us to learn how to have our Father in heaven as a reference point for timing and to trust it. The first thing we know about God is that God is not constrained by time as we know it. Both Augustine and C.S. Lewis referred to that really vital understanding. The theologian Karl Barth believed, as do I, that God can enter time when he wants, according to his pleasure, and step out of time however he wants. Leonard Sweet and Frank Viola, in their excellent book, Jesus, A Theography, puts it this way, with the birth of Christ, the eternal broke into space and time. He broke into space and time. That's what he did. And we know the Galatians 4.4 4 says, at the fullness of time, at the perfect time, he broke into space and time. But he, we know that he did that in different ways all throughout the Old Testament as well. Genesis 1.1 1, 1 and Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 tells us that God is the father of time. He created time. 
And time actually exists in him, not outside of him. For many of us, time is our master, right? We serve time. And when somebody else doesn't serve time the way we think they should serve time, we get frustrated with them. When someone doesn't come and meet you at a certain time that they said they would, they're stealing time from you. I think that's true. But we know that the Father does not serve time. Time serves the Father. And finally, we know that he is from everlasting to everlasting. Uh, there is no beginning, no end. Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. Uh, Psalm 90, verse 2. Acts 17, 28. Colossians 1, 17. Now, C.S. Lewis, I, I was going to quote him, but I'm just going to tell what he wrote in the book Mere Christianity. He says, one way to understand it is, let's say you're an author and you're writing about Mary. And you say that Mary wrote a book and then, you know, she went and did such and such. Uh, she is confined to whatever story you write. But as the author, you're not confined to her story. It's not a great way to put it. I mean, I simplified it. He's much more eloquent. But if you're the author of all of life and you write a story, those of us in the story are confined to the time that you plotted for us, right? The author is not confined to that time. That author can walk away from that story and do whatever he wants. That's how C.S. Lewis described it in Mere Christianity. And of course, the reason that is true, if you're doubting it, is Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. My ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. He says, don't try to figure it out. Really, I mean, you're gonna to have to trust me on this. I'm not confined to your time frame, and I am trustworthy when it comes to dictating time for you. So he is God, we are not. He is not constrained by time as we are. So for us to say, God's timing is way off here, or I don't see God's timing, or it makes no sense, really doesn't matter because he's not constrained by the same limits we are. This concept is essential in finding answers to some of our most frequent questions and difficult questions. Questions like, why is this happening? God's timing. Why can't I do what everybody else is doing? God's timing. Why am I not experiencing the success that others are experiencing? God's timing. Why can't I know what the future holds? God's timing. It's all about his timing. And we see this with Jesus when he delays in coming, in John 11, delays in coming to save Lazarus from death. Remember, his sisters come out and say, Jesus, if only you would come, you could have saved him. Jesus knew exactly what was going on, and he did this on purpose. It was to glorify God is what it was about. And so he had to wait before he came to allow him to fall asleep, for his body to fall asleep. Do you see how Jesus lived out the, the timing of the Father and how important it was and how the rest of us on earth don't get it and we complain to God like Mary and Martha did? <laughs> what are you thinking? And he just smiles and says, you know, it's, it's going to be okay. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? Is it, is it time? You're going to be an earthly king and a politician, right? Is it time now? He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. What Jesus said there is true of all time. The Father has a schedule, and he is not obligated to let us in on it. And during Jesus' life, he could even look into the future. Uh, regarding AD 70 and what would happen, we pick that up in Luke 19, verse 41. As he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace, but now it's too late. Your time is up regarding knowing me. That's what he's saying. It's too late. And peace is hidden from your eyes. You're not going to get peace because you didn't come to me. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and enclose you in on every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. You have missed it. I'm leaving. You've missed it. You could have had peace right here, right now. You refuse to do that. So guess what? He doesn't say 40 years, but in 40 years, less than 40 years, 
those huge stones at the temple that you are so proud of, they will come tumbling down. Your enemies will take you. And he wept. He wasn't happy to see that. He wasn't uh, exhilarated and saying, you're going to get yours. He's weeping saying, you missed it. You could have had ultimate peace, but you did not notice that God had visited you. How about his return? Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. However, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen, when he'll return again. He said, nobody knows that. God has not, the Father has not allowed anyone to know that. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. At that moment in time, the Son didn't even know when he's coming back. You couldn't say, well, let me give you a date to look forward to. He didn't even know. When the Son of Man returns, it'll be like it was in Noah's day. In those days, before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered the boat. Life was normal, he's saying. Everybody's doing what people always do until the very moment that Noah walked up the plank. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it'll be when the Son of Man comes. Because I'm not going to tell you the time. I don't even know the time. I can tell you what's going to happen. And it's going to happen. Then we're just going to go on doing life as normal until it's over. I don't know about you, but over the years I've thought, man, Lord, it's been 2,000 years. Seriously, isn't that time? Of course, again, Second Peter 3, 8. You must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think, about his return. No, he is being patient for your sakes. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. What is that about? The patience of God? Yes. Even more so? He's a good God. He does not want anyone to perish. And people will perish, but he doesn't want that. So why hasn't Jesus come back? Simply put from Peter, through the Holy Spirit, the Father's waiting till every possible person could repent. Notice the word repent. Not raise your hand, you're done. Get baptized, you're done. Repent, change your mind about whom you live for. Change your life about what life is about and serve God live for him, know him. He's waiting for as many people as possible to repent and then he will come. Time is a big deal in scripture and your leaders have at least seven more references. You can find many more references. They can read those too if you want. You can talk about them. I'm not going to go any further into them, but I am reminded of, I think it was the last time or the time before that we were in Tucson and Tammy wisely, wisely said, God is never late. What a great line. Tammy, you have a lot of lines, but that's maybe the best I've ever heard from you. God is never late. We think he is. Christy and I can attest to the fact, and there's so many times it's happened that we can't count them, that God's timing is perfect even when, maybe especially when, we don't understand it. Let's finish with this quick summary of some passages that talk about how perfect God's timing is. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 22, the smallest family will become a thousand people and the tiniest group will become a mighty nation at the right time i the lord will make it happen boy what a great theme if you want to understand the father at the right time he'll make it happen galatians 4 4 we mentioned this when the right time came god sent his son born of a woman it was the perfect time to do that we could go into that i think we've talked about it before ephesians chapter 1 verse 9 god has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ and everything in heaven and on earth. First Peter 5, 6, So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Did you hear it time and time again? <laughs> at the right time. At the right time. There is a right time. And most likely it's not my time. The right time is seldom my time. But this comes back to belief. If you believe, you trust, you have confidence that God's timing is absolutely perfect. I mentioned earlier about this place that's kind of a special place. I met Paul Miller years ago, maybe 19 some years ago, when he invited me out. And the reason he invited me out was to come and spend time with he and his wife. His wife, uh, very young at the time, maybe mid-late 30s, 
had been diagnosed with ALS a few months earlier, just a couple months earlier. She told me, she said, I used to go shooting with him. We went shooting all over the country and all of a sudden I couldn't lift the gun anymore. I didn't know what was happening. So I came to get to know her. I would need to do that because I would do her service just weeks later. That was the first time I can remember doing a service, a memorial service for someone who passed away from ALS. Several years later, fast forward in 2017, I believe, another dear friend of ours, uh, a woman who was probably in her 50s, was diagnosed with ALS. She lived for almost a year with it, and uh, I was privileged to be there several times to talk to her about this, but I was privileged to be there the day before she passed, and she was still cognizant enough, and she had some family around, and I gotta tell you this story, okay? I'm connecting these stories because they, they left this earth in the same kind of way, both Paul's wife and Tammy, our friend. Tammy, years ago, had made a Spider-Man blanket for Caleb. She just adored Caleb, as most people do, and she made a Spider-Man blanket for him. And he's had it on his bed for all these years. It's still there. But she gave it to me to give to him years ago and said, here's the condition of me giving you this blanket I made for Caleb. Don't ever tell him who gave it to him. I don't want him to know. She said, just don't let him know. Well, here she is. I know she's within a day or two of going to heaven. And she's not talking, but she, her eyes are open here and there. And so I had bent down there in that room. I remember like it was yesterday. And I put my arms around Tammy and I whispered in her ear, I told Caleb where the blanket came from just the other day. And I stepped back and she got a big smile on her face, like this is the right time. This is the right time. It was the right time for her. Her family didn't feel that way. We didn't feel that way. It was the right time for her. There is for many of us this suddenness of leaving this earth. Uh, I talked to you about our friend Mike who suddenly was gone and we know others who have suddenly been gone from this earth. It wasn't a long battle with cancer or ALS. Whether the time period of our leaving this earth is long and drawn out or it's sudden, doesn't really matter. It's God's perfect timing. So I want to close with this passage. Let this ring true for your heart. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, As God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. We beg you to accept this marvelous gift, but don't take it and then ignore it. Pretend like, oh, I'm done with that. He goes on. For God says, now he quotes our father. At just the right time, I heard you. On the day of salvation, I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. If you have not yet surrendered and submitted your life to Jesus, repented of the way you live and think, today is the day of salvation for you. Why wait another day? Today is the day you come to know him. I know there are some in the upper room who do not truly know Jesus. Many of us do, but there are some who don't. And you're waiting maybe until you're a better person. So Paul says that God says today is the day of salvation. The time is right time is right. Let that be your target. Today is your target because that's within the scope of God's timing for you. This is the day. Thanks for joining us in this place where targets are everywhere. <laughs> it's a wonderful place. Uh, Paul's a wonderful guy and uh, I tell you what, he loves the Lord. I pray that if you don't know the Lord, today is the day for you to step into his presence and living for him. God bless you. Thanks for joining us on this journey.